Welcome to the Ending Sexploitation Podcast, where we decode sexual harm and provide you with active solutions. I'm your host, Haley McNamara. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to dive into a little understood phenomenon today, and that is the topic of sex dolls, all with the incredible help of Caitlin Roper, PhD candidate, campaigns manager at Collective Shout. Thanks so much for joining us, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation, Haley. It's really nice to actually sort of meet in person. We've been emailing, collaborating on different things, but it's nice to actually see you. It is. No, I've just retweet you all the time. So it's nice to take our relationship into the next year. The podcast <laughs> year. Um, before we start, could you maybe explain a little bit about your work? Sure. So I work with uh, Collective Shout for a world free of sexploitation. For those who aren't familiar with our work, we are based in Australia. We're a grassroots campaigning movement against the objectification of women and the sexualization of girls in media, advertising, and popular culture. So I'm campaigns manager with Collective Shout, and we've been going for just over 10 years now. We had our 10th anniversary last year. And we've collaborated on some campaigns with Encozy and just lots of different things in in that space. And I'm also, as Haley said, I'm a PhD candidate where I'm studying female bodied sex dolls and sex robots or robotic dolls. Did you, grow up thinking that you would get into this kind of work. It's just interesting getting a PhD on such an, a dark topic doesn't seem like what little girls dream about. Yeah, this was not in my plan. It's, I, someone actually asked me today how I got here and I said, I can't, I couldn't even answer that question, but it, it definitely is one of those topics that's quite intense and potentially quite upsetting. So it's one of those things people will say, oh, you're doing a PhD, that's great. What's, what are you studying? What's your topic? And I'll kind of just size them up. Can they handle this? Or should I just say sociology yeah. and leave it? <laughs> yeah. No, no kidding. Oh, the, this, this sex dolls topic, I remember first really hearing about sex dolls from the, it was the 2007 movie, Lars and the Real Girl. I don't know Mm. if you ever saw that, but it seemed to really put sex dolls on the map. I mean, I know they were a thing before that, but, um, you know, starring Ryan Gosling, it was about this very shy, kind of socially challenged guy who had a lot of empathy for, and it was really more about him trying to have relationships with real people and struggling with that. Um, and they really avoided any salacious scenes um, regarding the sex dolls. But I guess that's when it first really came to my mind. How long have sex dolls really been a thing? Is th- this is a more recent phenomenon? It is. Well, in terms of the, the sex dolls we're seeing now, which are not like blow up dolls, they're just, they're really lifelike, they're pornified. But yeah, I think you're right. I think that movie really uh, started to bring it out into the mainstream and the sex doll manufacturer, Real Doll, who's one of the major manufacturers of, of these dolls, they were the ones who were consulted throughout that movie and I believe they provided the doll. It was a Real Doll doll. And they said that after the movie was released, their website crashed because they just got so many hits. So that was really instrumental, I think, in starting to bring this out into the mainstream. Wow, how how mainstream do you think it is now? Like, do you have to go to seedy parts of town to buy one? Well, I think it, it's mainstream enough that, that sex dolls and sex robots are featured in TV shows, films, documentaries, music videos, pornography, uh, and they're being sold on major global platforms. But in my research, I have been into a few adult stores just to see what is actually available and been really surprised that they do have some. I sort of thought, surely that'd be something, a bit of a niche item you'd have to order, but they have some. And I was quite surprised by that. Wow. I know when we've done some research on our Dirty Dozen list and that Collective Shout has also done campaigning around the fact that, I mean, you can find these kinds of things on Amazon, or at least up until recently, Amazon, like the Wish shopping app as well. And you've done some campaigning on that, right? 
That's right. I think it was 2017, 2018 that we campaigned against Wish and we got them to pull the products um, from their site. But it seems as though they've come back again. And it's one of those things we have to really stay on top of and say, hey, they're back. You need to you need to take action here. Yeah. We also had a campaign last year, a successful campaign against Alibaba, which is a major global online platform. It's sort of like the Chinese Amazon. Mm -hmm. And we called on them to remove these products and, and they did. And we're now in discussions with them about how we could possibly implement some sort of code of ethics that these online platforms abide by. Uh, so that, that's positive. I think a lot of online platforms struggle with this or with removing and staying on top of removing these items from from their platform but that said I mean it's not our responsibility it's not collective shout or Encozy or anyone else's responsibility to moderate these you know multi-billion dollar platforms like they, you think they could dedicate the resources to do that yeah you'd think it I feel like it can't be that hard. Maybe, maybe I'm a novice at you know the the intricacies of a retail website, but it seems like they're able to keep other things off of their platform that they are committed yeah. to not wanting. So just, it's right. interesting that they they keep trickling back in. When I think about sex dolls, a few kind of arguments for why sex dolls could be good come to mind, and I think come to most people's minds and. One of those questions is, well, what about really lonely people, um, maybe really elderly or maybe even disabled who are looking for some kind of companionship? I know there was a story recently about a 71-year-old retiree who was a Vietnam War veteran. He had, his wife had died um, a few years ago from cancer and felt very isolated. So he decided to purchase a sex doll and said that he felt some comfort from um, this object. I guess, what would your response be to this idea that, well, maybe lonely people should be able to have access to sex dolls? That's certainly the popular narrative around these items. Oh, but, you know, people are lonely. We should just let them have them. It's, you know, very much from that kind of perspective and the argument is being made a lot of the time by academics for all these things that you've listed you know people are lonely people who are grieving the death of a loved one you know intimate partner or who can't form relationships on their own or they're elderly or physically or mentally disabled all of these things there's so many reasons so many things they pull out as but what about this what about this these these dolls could be a solution to all of these all of these issues but there's a few things there and the first is that when they talk about people, that, that these could be a solution to pe people being lonely. It's not people, it's a very, it's a selection of people and it's male people that we're talking about. So what that effectively does is it makes this a gender neutral phenomenon when it's really highly gendered. It's, mm -hmm. it's like the, the prostitution industry. It's overwhelmingly female bodied dolls and a market of, 90% plus male buyers. So this, this way that they try and kind of make it gender neutral, it means that we're not really seeing what's going on. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is that this idea that sex dolls and robots could be a cure for loneliness. Mm -hmm. First of all, that's, that's kind of a nonsensical idea that if you own an object, you'll be less lonely. Mm -hmm. Like really, can't we do better than that? And then the next thing about that is if we well I mean, you know objects these are objects they're pieces of silicone in the shape of women and the idea that we could have a relationship with, with an object there's no relationship there's no mutuality mm. it's not a woman but it's being used as a stand-in for a woman and we can only accept that a piece of silicone can be a stand-in for a woman if we think women are objects. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that a piece of silicone can be interchangeable with a human being because we think women are objects as well. So it's this idea that we'll fix loneliness by allowing men to own objects, which are women, and that women are still property to be owned. So there's, there's so many things in here, but the logic just doesn't really stack up. And it 
uh, it, the premise of all of it is that women are objects or are interchangeable with objects. And that's, I mean, we've really got to challenge that, I think. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I had never really pieced together, you know, I, in my gut, you know, understood that sex dolls, um, it's very objectifying to women. It's treating, it's making it interchangeable with women as an object. But even just the idea of, that you mentioned of you buy this product and you won't be lonely. I mean, if we were talking about a car or a football or something, people would immediately recognize that that is nonsensical. So, but it's really I got forward -looking. That connection. Hmm. What about the idea that's a little bit more edgy and that's the idea that maybe these sex dolls could be therapeutic for pedophiles, particularly childlike right. sex dolls? Yeah, that, and that's an argument we hear quite a bit that men who, if they have child sex abuse dolls to simulate rape and abuse on, then they won't have to abuse living children but again, that's just a completely fundamentally flawed argument because what that's actually doing is it's it's reinforcing, it's an extension of men's abuse of children. It's another way they can abuse children. I, I spoke at an event a couple of weeks ago that you were at and I spoke about all the ways that men who own sex dolls, so child sex abuse dolls, uh, so when they have been arrested for, for importing them or possessing them, police also find typically they find other child sexual abuse material in their homes. So it's not like this one or the other kind of thing that, that people claim it is. It's these men are already sexually offending against children in different ways most of the time. So this idea that they will do that instead of that, it just, it doesn't make sense and it's not borne out in the reality. And what it actually does when you make uh, sex dolls modeled on the bodies of children, it legitimizes and normalizes this idea that children can be used for adult sexual gratification. So it legitimizes and normalizes children as sexual objects and the sexual use and abuse of children. And so this idea that this is helpful, really we're going backwards. You'd think what we want to be doing is when it comes to pedophiles or people, men who have these sexual desires for children is to be challenging that, encouraging them to engage in healthier practices and relationships and not just saying, okay, well, you want this, you have to have it. Like that's, it's a ridiculous notion, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. And I think it's also, I remember there's this kind of trite phrase, but it's the idea of neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's something that's always stuck out to me, which is I feel like you shouldn't be able to practice abusing a child. And then that makes it less likely that you would abuse a child. It seems like it would have an escalating or a reaffirming, like you said, effect. And the risk is just very great. And what we're hearing from the advocates of child sex abuse dolls is that oh, we just need to do the research. What does that look like? I don't know how that's mm. possible. I don't know how to do that in an ethical way. And I just think the risk is too great just so men can have sex in the specific way they want to have it, that we put children at risk. Like it's just Who's crazy. Who's making these? I mean, because I guess basically the entire premise of you know this question is that there are child-like sex dolls, or I like the term you used, child sex abuse dolls that are being produced and sold. How is that legal? I mean, I, I know different countries have different laws, but that's that's just wild to think about. Sure. So they tend to be coming out of China and Japan um, from, from what I've seen. I do know of one company uh, in Japan called Trotla, uh, where the... Um, the man who makes them is actually a self-identified pedophile. So he argues that he's doing a public service, mm -hmm. that he's making these dolls so that men will use those instead of real children. And that, that's the argument that we hear all the time. Yeah. Do you, are, so you're based in Australia, are child sex abuse dolls legal there? 
In Australia, no. Uh, we've got a few states which have taken action um, to criminalise child sex abuse dolls, but also we had federal legislation passed, uh, I think in 2019, which makes it illegal to possess, import, advertise, for, solicit, all of those things, um, child sex abuse dolls. So that's part of our um, ending child sexual exploitation legislation. So I know there are some countries that have also taken steps to criminalise child sex abuse dolls, and I believe there's a few states in the US, um, but other ones, other countries are just using existing obscenity laws, I believe, to when, when, they, are, when they come into the airport, they, they regard them as obscene items, so they're still illegal, but there's not specific legislation for them. Yeah, I know in the U.S. there is a bill um, called the Creeper Act that's kind of in limbo. I mean, anyone who's listening, call your representatives and tell them to promote this bill that would outlaw, um, outright outlaw child sex abuse stalls. But in the in the U.S., are a lot of arguments come up against that, saying that it's free speech, that this is a free speech issue. Um, what's, what's your perspective on that? I think even the idea that pornography is speech, when it, when it, what it really is, is it's acts, it's real acts being done. So when a woman in pornography is choked, for example, on film, that's because a real woman is being choked. Mm-hmm. So this idea that pornography or child sex abuse dolls or sex dolls are all they come under the category of free speech or freedom of expression or sexual expression it's it's a really strange concept when it comes to child sex abuse dolls when men are using these it, it's not speech it's not fantasy it's an act in the world they have gone from you know maybe viewing child exploitation material to now the next step which is an escalation into action so they've now gone from viewing to a behavior so they've purchased a child sex abuse doll or and now they've started acting out on a child sex abuse doll so the idea that this is speech I just feel like it's it's really quite flawed and if it is speech we have to ask whose speech are we hearing whose voices are we hearing whose voices are we not hearing are we hearing the speech of children who are being abused and children who have been abused in new ways through the use of these these dolls we know of cases where uh, perpetrators, uh, men who are found in possession of child sex abuse dolls, have been found with dolls with the faces of, like the photos of children, real children, uh, put stapled on the doll's face. Uh, And cases where dolls have been modelled on living children or where doll manufacturers have offered to customise dolls based on living children. So are we hearing from these children? Like whose voices are we hearing in this, if this is speech? So we really have to ask whose rights are being protected, rights in inverted commas, Mm -hmm. and whose rights are being violated and denied and who is being silenced. And I think surely the rights of children need to take precedence over this supposed right of men to simulate sex sexual abuse on a childlike doll. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that sex dolls are, and we we touched on this a little bit, but I love if you could expand on it. Do you think that they're only harmful when they're based on the image of children, when they're childlike, or are they inherently harmful? I think they're inherently harmful. I think, as I've said, they're mostly modeled on the bodies of women and girls. So, and this is happening in a context where women and girls are already being objectified, where this, this view that women are property exists to be, that they're objects and to be owned, these views are still prevalent. So the idea that we want to continue this or extend this into sex dolls, it's incredibly unhelpful. So what, what are these dolls doing? They are allowing men to just have this, complete sexual freedom to enact any kinds of sexual or sexually violent acts on these replica women and children. So it's not challenging men's sexual entitlement in any way. It's giving them free reign and it's reinforcing this idea that women are 
sexual objects, that we're objects, that we exist for men's sexual use. And that's what we're for. That's all we are. And reinforcing, <clears throat> excuse me, women's subordinate status. And again, we've got to look at the wider context, which is a, a culture where women are already subjected to male violence and you know, rape and sexual abuse and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, harmed in prostitution and pornography. So women are already being harmed from being treated like objects. And the idea that we would want to extend that or find a new way to play out these same dynamics, it's really undermining our efforts to fight for gender equality and women's rights and women's basic humanity, things that are still lacking. Yeah, and I I also think, you know, the idea that people can pick the eye color, pick the hair color, pick the size of different body parts is just a good illustration of showing, it's just icky to me. <laughs> I'm not a very, uh, I'm not a very unbiased person talking to you about this, but it, it really does, I think, just enforce, enforce that sexual objectification and, and yeah, encourage that, that same sexual entitlement. Do you have concern about rope, these sex robots that are getting even more like life, lifelike. I feel like every few years at a major pornography convention, there comes a lot of headlines about the latest robot that can talk to you or, or you know, simulate more real life uh, actions. What, what do you have? Do you have any thoughts on that? I do think in part, that's just a lot of PR. Uh, the reality is we don't really have sex robots we have robotic dolls so we have dolls where you have the doll body and then you can have a robotic head and it can do a few things it can kind of move its mouth and blink and and things like that and you pair it with your smartphone or something like that so you get some degree of interaction but like they can't stand up unassisted they can't walk around so this idea that we have sex dolls sorry sex robots and that you know in this many years we can be marrying them or having relationships with them and they'll replace women in that sense I mean they it's this really futuristic kind of idea of sex robots that just doesn't exist mm. and I think it's really um yeah we're not there we're really not there we're very far away from that I don't know if we'll ever be at that yeah I I mean I hope we never get to that I know I've had some concerns about maybe the pairing of virtual reality with sex dolls but um, but still, yeah, that isn't this kind of vision of, you know, falling in love with a robot that you maybe see in some movies. What about how you see sex dolls intersecting? Do you see sex dolls intersect with other aspects of the sex trade? I know you've kind of mentioned pornography, some, um, what about, I know there's some, even actually in in England where I'm living now, I think there was a sex doll brothel that popped up before COVID. Yeah, there are sex doll brothels uh, in a number of countries around the world now. Uh, I think in Madrid, there's one that has a sex dungeon and in the Czech Republic, they have some sort of virtual reality options. So this is definitely a thing. And again, it's an extension of the sex trade. And the other thing is, even without the sex doll brothels, there's very much a prostitution-like dynamic in the sex doll, sex owner relationship. I use the term relationship loosely. Uh -huh. um, it's like replicating the sex buyer and prostituted woman dynamic. And men, as they discuss their sex dolls that they, they own, they are quite open with some of the reasons that they, they buy the female-bodied sex dolls. And they're often very similar to the reasons men cite for paying to sexually exploit women in prostitution. So if they say things like, well, they'll make the point that they like that they're always sexually available, that they allow men to have sex whenever and however they want, that they're calling all the shots. They don't have to work around anyone else or consider anyone else's feelings or needs or humiliation or pain. They like the compliance. They like the variety and the lack of drama and even the fantasy or illusion of being desired, which they sort of, some of them convince themselves that their dolls are into it, which is a whole other discussion. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, so it, there very much is a connection, I think, with the sex trade on this. That's so telling hearing the reasons why sex doll owners themselves say that they're interested in that kind of reaction. Because I think if people hear those reasons, they automatically understand why it's harmful to society to, to be promoting or normalizing that kind of thing. Um, my yeah. last question for you um, is, do you have any actions that you'd recommend people take who maybe want to push back against the sex doll phenomenon? Um, anything that you would recommend people could do? Well, that's a great question because I was just thinking this is something that Encrozy and Collector Shout need to sit down and have a conversation about. Yeah, we do. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that has been effective that Collector Shout has done has been going to the platforms and challenging the platforms. This is particularly useful when it comes to child sex abuse dolls because I think there's generally an understanding that these products are pretty horrific mm -hmm. and not really defensible if, if you go to these different platforms and say, is this in line with your corporate values and ethics? Then it's generally not going to be. The more challenging case is when it comes to the, the so-called adult sex dolls. So sex dolls and robots that are modeled on the bodies of adult women. Because I think a lot of people just say, oh, well, that's, that's fine. It's the same sort of comparison between you know, pornography and child sexual abuse material or so-called child pornography, whatever we call it, people say, oh, that's really bad when it happens to children. That's obviously a, a terrible abuse and that we should not have that. We should be ending that. But then when it comes to pornography where adults are, are featured, they sort of say, oh, well, you know, that's fine. It's a free choice now. As if, you know, once a woman, once a child, a girl becomes 18, now she's not exploited anymore. So I think those attitudes are still quite persistent with a lot of people and they sort of think, oh, I wouldn't want a sex doll. I think that's a bit weird, but whatever. Let other people do whatever they want without any real understanding of how this impacts on women and girls. Mm. Yeah, But absolutely. I would love to talk with you about this more. Good. Well, everyone stay tuned. Maybe more actions will be coming out. Um, I know it's something that we along with Collective Shout Think is so important to be addressing. So thank you so much, Caitlin, for taking the time to talk with us and where can people, can people follow you on, on Twitter or where else can they find you? That's right. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter at Caitlin underscore Roper and I'm on Instagram at it's Caitlin Roper. So if you're interested in these issues, feel free to follow me there. I do tend to be a bit vocal about them. Good, good. We need more people being vocal like you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you for having me.